Welcome to Booked, where two guys say about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Olivia Snedden. This week, we're going to do a new old book. So <laughs> we did Casino Royale, which was like an old book. We've done a bunch of new books. Uh, this one is a re-release and something I, I know, and I think I speak for both of us. I'm glad we had an opportunity to read because we have known of this book. Um, and, and it's kind of been on my really long um, to be read list for a number of years now. Um, so this is The Little Sleep by Paul Tremblay, which was originally released 12 years ago, 2009, um, but it's been re-released. Um, it's, it's out now. Now, whenever you're hearing this, the book is available for you to purchase. Um, so I'm going to let Rob tell you a little bit about Paul. All right. So Paul Tremblay has won the Bram Stoker British Fantasy in Massachusetts Book Awards and is the author of Growing Things, The Cabin at the End of the World, Disappearance of Devil's Rock, A Head Full of Ghosts, and the crime novels The Little Sleep and No Sleep Till Wonderland. He's also the author of a story in the booked anthology. Um, his essays and short fiction have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, Entertainment Weekly Online, and numerous years' best anthologies. He has a master's degree in mathematics and lives outside of Boston with his family, and he removed the part of his bio where it talked about him not having a uvula, so I figure I had to bring it up anyway. Man has no uvula. I mean, any longtime listener will know that. It comes up like <laughs> once a year, it seems like. so. All right, here is the synopsis for The Little Sleep. Mark Genovich is a South Boston PI with a little problem. He's narcoleptic, and he suffers from the most severe symptoms, including hypnagogic, hypnagogic, hop, Hip, uh, hypnagogic, hypnagogic, hip, or gogic? Yeah, that. He, uh, including hallucinations. These waking dreams wreak havoc for a guy who depends on real-life clues to make his living. Clients haven't exactly been beating down the door when Mark meets Jennifer Times, daughter of the powerful local DA and a contestant on American Star, who walks into his office with an outlandish story about a man who stole her fingers. He awakes from his latest hallucination alone, but on his desk is a manila envelope containing risque photos of Jennifer. Are the pictures real? And if so, is Mark hunting a blackmailer or worse? Wildly imaginative and with a pitch-perfect voice, Paul Tremblay's Little Sleep is the first in a new series that casts a fresh eye on the rigors of detective work and introduces a character who has a lot to prove, if only he can stay awake long enough to do it. All right, so I guess right out the gate, I have to ask the question, because Livius pulled the information together for uh, for this episode. Um, is this the synopsis that's being presented? This is not from the new release of the book, right? Because they called it a new series. Yeah, that is. Uh, so on Amazon, there does not appear to be a synopsis. So this came from the Goodreads, uh, which is for his original release of this. That makes more sense. I was like, Wait but to be a to minute. be fair, to be fair, I'm pretty sure they're releasing the other one. So it's kind of like an old new series. Old new, not new new. No, not new new. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty decent. Uh, so I, um, before we go into it, um, I didn't know much about narcolepsy, uh, going into this book and I didn't do any, I just kind of like trusted what the book told me about how it works. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I'm assuming it's accurate and not like, you know, kind of bent to his needs, but there's definitely aspects of narcolepsy that I was not aware of. I didn't know that. Um, like at certain points it describes kind of like, well, it says hallucinations a couple times in the, in the synopsis. Um, I didn't know that that was a possibility. There are aspects of narcolepsy that I did not, I was not aware of until, uh, reading this book for sure. I, uh, I also am not an expert in narco sleepy, but, um, I do feel like I have had the starting to drift off kind of hallucinations, so I can imagine if you're kind of in that state a lot, you might. Does right. That make sense? Like a waking dreaming thing or mm -hmm. actual hallucinations? Yep. I, I would say, well, I, to me, I guess they seem like hallucinations because I assume I'm awake. You know what I mean? But yeah, probably right. like a waking dreaming kind of thing. So I imagine if you're already prone to being on the verge of sleep a lot, that might happen more often. Makes sense. Now I want to slam the brakes on everything to point out. That you made a reference to a movie called Gunshy, which is obscure as hell, 
and you're not a movie watching guy, so like I, I'm floored. I don't know. I, I don't. I, I'm going to assume that the narco sleepy is the is the thing that you're, yeah. you're referencing. So you didn't. Yeah, I don't know what that. I don't know what that <laughs> movie is. I don't know where I heard narco sleepy, but I always thought it was. Uh, it was you know, it's just pretty apt. So. Oh, all right. well, all right. So I gave you more credit than you deserved, but yeah, that was a uh, gunshot. Was a, a movie with like Oliver Platt and Liam Neeson, and it's kind of a gangster weird, but like it's more comedy. Anyway, um, thought yeah, I thought you were going for a thing there, uh, but you were just being a little silly. All right, so um, the story kicks off, and as is mentioned right in the synopsis, that uh, we're introduced to Mark Genovich, and he is talking to a client who is Jennifer Times, who is a uh, this American star, but I, I think. For the purposes of this review, or if you're listening, you can kind of insert American Idol on there. So she's on a national TV show where she uh, is singing and there are rounds and she has made it, uh, I believe, into the finals. But as he's uh, talking to her, um, she wants him to look for the man that stole her fingers. She even holds up a kind of like bandaged up hand, you know, with that's got fingers missing at, at some point, um, except that. He awakes and she is gone. And in her place is an envelope with uh, with two photographs in it. Um, one of them of a, a young teen blonde girl who bears a striking resemblance to Jennifer, who was in his office, um, dressed, sitting on a bed. And the next photo, a, a little more risque as she is less dressed in photo number two. And this is where we, we discover that uh, uh, the narcolepsy has the unfortunate side effect of um, sometimes he'll be asleep, but like, um, acting as if he is awake. So he'll have conversations, he'll do stuff, he'll go places or whatever. And so, um, obviously at some point he fell asleep while Jennifer was there and lost his memory of everything, um, up to the point where he woke up and there was that manila envelope on his desk. Um, he does when he's in that state, have the ability to like take notes and stuff. So he'll look for, his notes that he was taking, but usually they're, they're kind of gibberish. And, um, in, in this case, he's got, he's got some, uh, holes in the story that he needs to fill. So, um, obviously one of the first thoughts he has is I need to go see this person, uh, tries to call her and he can't get through. So he decides to find out where she is because she's a local person and, um, go to visit her. Uh, and she's doing like a, a signing at a mall, like a autograph kind of thing in a local mall. So he goes to see her there. And um, this is where it gets interesting. This is where it starts to kick in that like, you know, maybe, you know, talking to your clients while you're asleep and not remembering anything is, is not helpful because he goes to talk to her and she has no recollection of who he is. And so he's absolutely not welcome and, and kind of removed from the scene by her security detail and now he has to figure out wait what the hell this person came to me and now she's saying she doesn't she doesn't even know who i am through the course of these events we get a look back at, at how mark ended up this way and and i want to mention you know we don't spend a lot of time i don't feel like talking about the appearance of characters in books because it's it's mostly uh, inconsequential um but in this one he is a haggard uh, at least, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, kind of haggard looking, scruffy uh, man. Uh, his narcolepsy is due to a uh, car accident that he was in. So he has uh, uh, a, a busted up face that he tries to cover with a beard. So he's really just kind of an unkept guy who, you know, by his own words is often, you know, like people across the street to, to avoid him or, or he's he's looked upon, you know, uh, by others as, you know, uh, I don't want to say dangerous, but, you know, someone you don't want to be involved with, which also I think contributes a little bit to how he's treated um, when he goes to the uh, the mall performance or signing or, or whatever it is. Um, so we do get a little bit of backstory through the course of these things happening. Now, through talking to his mother, who is a huge fan of uh, uh, this American star TV show, um, he does find out that uh, Jennifer is the daughter of the local DA. And not just that, 
but that the local DA was friends with Mark's now deceased father. And when I say now deceased, I guess I'll let Rob elaborate on that a little bit. But that he does have an in through his family and even at one point considers that perhaps the Billy Times, the DA, may have even sent um, his daughter his way, knowing that, you know, this this could be kept quiet because of the family ties. That's the uh, that's one of the interesting aspects of the book is that while he's um, investing, <laughs> investigating a case that he doesn't know much about, he also has to dig into his own family past in order to get information that may help him. So he's actually kind of, he's investigating multiple avenues at the same time. There's the Jennifer times thing. There's also like his, his dad's relation to this, uh, Billy times DA guy. And, and so the family part of it, I'll just say really quick, his father died when he was really young, like five years old. And Paul does this cool thing where sometimes when, uh, Mark is in his weird sleepy state, his, his narco sleepy, as Livia said, um, he'll have these kind of dreams of of being with his father, and there's it's like a recurring dream. So the same activity is happening in every dream, but he talks about different things with his father every time. So uh, it's obvious that there's like a a weird thing with his dad because he was so young when his dad died. Um, but that plays out pretty cool as as the story evolves. One other thing that happens pretty early on in the book that ties into the overall story, which we probably won't spend too much time talking about is he is also um, kind of hired in a parallel way by uh, a person named Brendan Sullivan um, in similar circumstances where he's hired. He doesn't remember anything about the case, but he gets a call from Brendan saying, have you found it? Um, and he he does the thing where he's like, let's meet and talk about it so that he can learn what it is without revealing that he doesn't remember what it is. So he's got several different threads of things going on at the same time as the story starts. And that sounds very complicated, but here's what I will say. It plays out very smoothly in the book. And I think that's one of the the strengths of the book is that um, it doesn't feel like there's like too much information. It's paced well, and it all kind of just flows nicely, especially if this is his first novel. I feel like he did a great job like building... A very smooth narrative. Yeah, I mean, so there's two things at play here. So first of all, we have a very different kind of unreliable narrator, right? Because we only know what Mark knows. And Mark doesn't mm. know shit <laughs> because of his conditions. So it's not that we're being purposely misled, which can happen in, you know, with unreliable narrators, or you've got someone who doesn't know the difference. Hey, Mark, maybe a little bit, but not, you know, we're not talking about somebody who doesn't know the difference between reality and and and. I was going to say fiction, but not reality, right? I mean, he's basically just operating under this medical condition. And so that's the one thing we have going on. And then second, we have a private investigator who doesn't know what he's looking for and really kind of questions who he's even working for. So he doesn't know exactly what the goal is. And he doesn't know who's hired him to do it, which creates a very interesting dynamic for um, a private detective that has to solve more mysteries than any other private detective we've ever read. Cause most of them at least have something solid to go on from the beginning. Like they're assigned a task and they have to figure out how to solve the t- task, but not, not Mark. Mark is not really clear on what the objective is or who he's performing said objective for. I think that's, that's one of the more, compelling parts of it is that the, there's mm-hmm. no point in the story where he's not fully behind the eight ball. Um, so it's like, how the hell is this all going to work out? Um, but the thing that compels him forward is that he's meeting resistance in ways that like, it's like a, where there's smoke, there's fire type situation. Like if, if there's people that are interested in what he's doing um because he 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 runs into like some thugs you know at at certain points and stuff like that who are you know they're not getting directly to the point but it's obvious that they're trying to either stop him or find what he's looking for or whatever it happens to be so (laughs) he has enough people being interested in either stopping him or finding out what he's supposed to find out that it moves him like it it, that's his internal motivation for solving the case uh, until 
the, the picture becomes clearer. Um, so I, I, again, I feel like the, the setup of the book is, um, is really well done, uh, because it, it, it seems like a really hard story to tell because you're basically taking away all of your storytelling tools. Um, but he still managed to make a really compelling story out of it. I know I'm like, I sound like I'm wrapping up, but like, as we're talking about this, I'm realizing there's lots of feats that are happening that are pretty impressive. Yeah. I, on the outside, even reading the, um, the synopsis, it just sounds like your standard PI story, right? Which I mean, look, the little sleep is obviously a nod to the, the big sleep. I think that's Raymond Chandler, right? Um, which is a, a, you know, legendary, uh, PI story, you know, complete with hat and uh, and uh, trench coat type PI, and you know, there's a lot of those, and those can be those can be good. Those can be, um, oh, what's a J.K. Rowling pseudonym? Uh, Galbraith, R- yes, Robert right. Galbraith, yeah, yep, yep. And you remember how boring that was, right? Like it was just <laughs> yeah. a straightforward PI story, and it was just a PI going around asking questions, getting a lead, asking another question. So the element that he introduces. Um, really makes for a much more engaging investigation. And then, you know, we've talked a little bit about Mark, but, you know, we're, we're, we're hearing all of this in his voice, right? So he's self-deprecating because of his condition and, and kind of the way life has turned out for him. So he's also an engaging and, and often amusing um, character to, to follow. So that's where, you know, these where this book diverges from what very simply could have been um, – you know, just a straight up PI novel and, and likely wouldn't have gotten much attention if it wasn't for the way it's drawn up. Right. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, typically you have that unlikable, like there's the stereotypical, like unlikable guy just because he's a piece of shit, but like, he's got some sort of, um, detective acumen that makes him good at his job but he's not a likable person. And in this case, like he, his appearance and his condition make him appear to be unlikable. And it's something that he's overcoming. So it's not in, it's not because of his personality that he's unlikable. It's kind of in spite of it or whatever, but you get what I'm saying. But um, Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a different approach on the unapproachable um, detective. So yeah, it's good stuff. I want to address one more thing because I realized because you and I read the book, we have a good understanding that someone who's listening might not because if I was listening, I think I would think like, why the fuck would this guy with this con- condition decide to be a PI? Like it seems like a very um, uh, like like going for the most challenging thing you can. And to clarify earlier <laughs> in the in the book, um, he, he states that basically most of the stuff he does. So this book was written. What did you say, Rob? 17 years ago, 2009, right? Yeah, so 14, 2009. 15 years ago. Yep. Um, still in what I would call the early days of the, the Internet. Most people didn't have access to the Internet at their fingertips. Um, no smartphones. Uh, not everyone I, I know, at least at that time, had Internet. So he, most of the stuff he does, he does in his office. Like he tracks down stuff using public records. So his his narcolepsy typically isn't as big an impediment as it is when he's going to have to be kind of boots on the ground right like chasing down leads like normally he even says his job is he sits in front of his computer and you know finds shit that way that's a good point i had thought about that but yeah he does paul does cover all the bases of like incredulity that you might uh you might experience uh as far as the story goes um from here we can't really go or we shouldn't really go too much deeper into it but the idea is he's got to figure out um what he was hired for, how everything ties together with these risque photos that were mentioned in the, um, the synopsis and who are all the interested parties and how they play together. So he's got to figure out everything and solve the case. Um, and that's, that's what, and, and because of the weird incomplete threads of information that he has, um, it's difficult to trust people, um, and, and, and so that's kind of what the, the driving force of the story is. Um, and then also, you know, learn a little bit more about a family that he hasn't really probably thought too much about, but since it's being kind of dredged up in this case, 
he has no choice but to kind of go down memory lane as well. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much the the way that the the book goes um, that we can talk about at least. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. We didn't really mention his mom very much. His mom is uh, is quite the character too, Ellen, who. Um, You know, even though he's an adult because of his narcolepsy, spends a lot of time kind of looking after him and the the, the shit this poor lady has to go through with this guy, at least during the course of this book is uh, is uh, admirable, I would say. Like we, we see the daily the daily stuff he goes through, like falling asleep, smoking on his couch all the time. And there's a description of his couch and it's just got dozens of burn holes in it. You know, so she's constantly worried he's going to burn himself to death. But then she's kept in the dark through uh, through this book. And, and, you know, she just has to keep dealing with these situations that come up and trying to help her son um, because of this disability that he has. Um, and he's just trudging along trying to solve his case. And it's a it's an interesting dynamic between the two of them, for, for sure. Yeah. And it's one of those situations where, like, uh, <laughs> you know, he wants to not rely on people and he kind of probably even frames it to himself that way like he doesn't he doesn't need a caretaker but she's just always around and she is actually helpful um his office and apartment are in the same building and it's the building that's owned by his mom so there's a lot of things that are going on that that uh tip in the direction of he really really needs her um in his life but he doesn't want to have to but he doesn't really have a choice all right um I don't know that there's anything left to say um, about this one. I don't, we're not going to go to spoiler talk on this. I'm assuming. I don't think that we have enough. Yeah. To talk about there. Um, But uh, I I mean, I'll, I'll start off with a wrap ups. Uh, I've been wanting to read this book probably since swallowing a donkey's eye. Um, If not, then maybe a head full of ghosts. So for, for a number of years and, and this re-release gave us a chance to do that. Um, you know, and, and still have a, a fresh book um, newly released to review. So I'm really glad that, that we got a chance to do it. Um, I, I, I mean, I basically covered my wrap up, I think, in in through the course of the review, but I'll, I'll go over it a little bit. I like Mark Genovich. I like his character. Um, self-deprecating, um, but still willing to do the job. Obviously, he has to overcome obstacles, which, uh, you know, is an interesting take on on how to do the the PI job and, and interesting in its story format. Um, there's some weird shit going on in this book. And, and you know, some of that may be due to our, uh, our narrator's um, understanding of how things are happening, but it really provides an additional element um, for what would otherwise probably be a fairly you know, run of the mill, not terribly exciting PI story. Um, hard to find fault with this book. I mean, out of my, my the eight categories that we used to review, I've got all eights and nines, and and I've got them pretty balanced out. Uh, final score of eight and a half. I I really enjoyed this book. Yeah, everything Olivia said. This one's pretty uh, like this one's pretty cut and dry. Like Paul just wrote a really damn solid story. He had a um, his own kind of fresh take on on a PI book and uh put interesting obstacles in the way of his protagonist um but somehow the like even though the path is very muddy the pace is very smooth um the narrative works very well and um he makes you really enjoy reading the characters even there's a couple of goons that show up every now and then and it's not necessarily that the goons as characters are good but the scenes are good so even the smaller characters um contribute well to the overall story uh like livia said it's really hard to find a fault with this there are some there are some things that seem like i could start to kind of pick apart a little bit as far as like what happens when the character kind of has like a, a, a fit where he got, he falls asleep and wakes up later and there's an outcome that happens that you wouldn't expect based on what was going on. However, um, he cleverly addresses that with, um, with other aspects of, of the condition. So even the stuff that I would want to pick apart, he's already kind of shored that up with, um, with how he developed the character and the character's condition. So um, it, it's pretty unassailable, dude. This is a really 
easy read. I, I, I sat down to start the book because I like to dip my toe in and just kind of get an idea for the story. And next thing I knew, I was a third of the way through the book. So it's an easy read. It's entertaining. It's got very likable characters. The plot is smooth and the conclusion is very satisfying. So like, I can't say anything really bad about it. I actually, um, I started out with a lower score than what I'm ending at, but as we talked about it, I did flip a few scores a little bit higher just because talking about it helped me realize that I was kind of maybe undervaluing some stuff. Overall, I'm eight and a half points as well, which scores this for the podcast as an eight and a half out of 10, which a uh, pretty damn good score if you ask me. For sure. Um, this was nominated for a Bram Stoker Award. Can we talk about that for a second? <laughs> that's a little bit, uh, that's a little odd. I, well, I, I had a Mark Genovich moment where while I was reading it, I was like, how the hell was this nominated for a Bram Stoker Award? Not based on quality, but based on horror. And then, like, I asked Rob, and Rob's like, I don't know. I'm like, I know I've heard this somewhere, and I'm pretty sure I heard it from Paul, but I, I did find out in 2009 it was nominated for Best First Novel, um, and uh, it, it was it was it did not win. Um, Damnable by Hank Schwable, Schwable, S-C-H-W-A-E-B-L-E, um, won. Uh, all I can say is, you know, Paul Paul went on to win Bram Stoker Awards, um, I believe, for A Head Full of Ghosts and maybe for The Disappearance of Devil's Rock. I don't know, but I know he won them. He won it. He got there. It was for... Yeah, it, so um, <laughs> three three of them, A Head Full of oh, Ghosts, wow. The Cabin at the End of the World, and Growing Things and Other Stories, all reviewed here on Booked, going back those uh, six years now to A Head Full of Ghosts. <laughs> uh, Disappearance at Devil's Rock was nominated. The Little Sleep was nominated. And then he actually had two short fiction stories in 2007, The Teacher, and There's No Light Between Floors. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know. That's uh, this is probably the least horror of a novel I've read that was nominated for a Bram Stoker. I, I think you might agree with that. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Because there's really like no element of horror to this, except for maybe the existential horror of dealing with narcolepsy, but uh... <laughs> that, 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 or putting in a bunch of dream sequences into your novel, <laughs> the horror think, of that. And then also you, when yeah. you have a narcoleptic, you, you have to do some dreams. I, yeah. Look, I had, quite no honestly, I only mentioned it now at the end because I didn't even <laughs> ding this story for it, which is uh, something <laughs> I frequently, yeah. frequently mention. Um, when you start talking about dreams, I was like, I'm not even going to bother with complaining about the dream <laughs> sequences in this one. So, um, but yeah, nice job, Paul. You know, 15 years ago when you wrote this, um, awesome. and congratulations on on getting it back out there. Um, I think we mentioned it earlier, but if not, I do believe that the follow up. Um, no sleep till Wonderland will also be released uh, April, I believe. Yeah, April so four twenty, April twentieth. Yep. It's coming out. There you go. Hey, can we talk about a Mark Genovich moment I had where I was like, "Wait a minute, did this happen?" <laughs> yes, we can. Please. <laughs> um, I said that as if Livius doesn't already know what I'm going to talk about. That's like the peeking behind the curtain. Um, so it, it, even in the synopsis. It, it says, um, uh, walks into his office with an outlandish story about a man who stole her fingers. So, like, that's even in the synopsis. And I was like, that sounds real familiar. And I don't remember exactly where it came from. So I did kind of like a mental, I flipped through in my head, where would that have have been? And um, it's not the story that he put in the book anthology. It's not part of any of the other novels that we read. Uh, and I was like, uh, warmed and bound. So Warmed and Bound, for anybody who's a newer listener, is an anthology that we talked about at length for months uh, over dozens of episodes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like, in a weird, like, looking back, it seems weird how much time we dedicated to this one book. Um, but I think overall it was probably 18 or 19 episodes in a row. Uh, but uh, Warmed and Bound had a story from Paul called Chance the Dick. And in Chance the Dick... Uh, there's a detective named Chance who is approached by a woman who um, wants to hire him to find out who took her fingers. And it's basically the same kind of setup as what we read in this book. So um, that is a story that was originally published in um, Paul's short story collection that came out along around the time of, of these books originally. And that's a story collections called in the meantime, I believe so. Uh, 
I think that at the time he was just kind of playing around with this idea. I don't know. I, I know we haven't talked to Paul about the fingers thing, right? That's never come up. I don't believe so. Well, after talking to you to, to explain, I thought the fingers thing sounded familiar, but I assumed that maybe we had yeah. talked with Paul about this book. Like maybe he gave us a little bit of a setup for it or something. And that's why it was sticking in my head. But after talk, talking to you, I, I don't believe we've talked with him about it. Cause like if he put it in two different works now, I'm wondering if he's just obsessed with like someone stealing someone's fingers or something like there's gotta be, there's gotta be an origin for that. Um, I do believe and I'm going to save you maybe a little bit of trouble. I do believe that maybe, um, Maybe there is so on the Goodreads page I found, and I, I don't know if, if Paul's really thrilled about this. The little sleep page has him, a, a very young looking Paul, um, doing like a QA at the Boston Public Library around the time this book came out. So, uh, if you've got a few minutes, you can check that out uh, as a five minute clip. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe there's a little bit, maybe there's a little bit in there about missing fingers. There you go. That might be the horror part of the book. The fact like that yeah. The like someone showing up with their fingers replaced. Mm-hmm. Cuz it's kind of a creepy image. It would definitely be something that would be like during that. Do you remember back in the day? So this is going to age both of us. You, you uh when MTV had all those weird animated shows like The Max and stuff and mm-hmm. Aeon Flux or whatever. Yes. Like I feel like that's something that would show up in one of those weird late night MTV cartoons. I also feel, yes, you are correct. But I also feel that around that time, there were a lot of authors that were toying with um, like self mutilation, like people cutting off limbs and stuff. So it, yeah. it, uh, it comes up in hell's half acre from Will Christopher Bear. Yep, yep. It comes up in Brian Evanson's uh, novella, The Name Escapes Me Now. Um, but yeah, it feels like around that time, like loss of uh, appendages was kind of a big thing. So I don't know if that, <laughs> if, if historians will look back on the, you know, early 2000s as, <laughs> as a time where that was a big deal in fiction. But it seemed like it popped up quite a bit around that time. You know what I'm thinking too about is... um that Warren Ellis book, Crooked Little Vein, where they were doing weird yes. shit like in, injecting stuff mm-hmm. in their balls and stuff. Yep. Such yeah. a brilliant book. God, I love that book. I have two copies of it on my shelf. That's kind of neat. It's an awesome, awesome book. All right. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know how much more we have to talk about, but I do want to cover next week's special episode. Mm. Um, since uh, So we went old book, new book, old book. And now we're going to go old book again, because apparently we've given up on new releases. Um, We are going to be reviewing a book that Rob and I are, I believe Rob said, 17 years late in reading. Um, All the Beautiful Sinners by Stephen Graham Jones. We will be joined by our permanent holiday co-host, Jesse and Misty, to talk about uh, um, the first book that I heard about from Stephen Graham Jones. Apparently the second book he had published. Um, And uh, I will be honest. I'm uh, I, I tried this book when I first stumbled across Clevenger and and Bear and of course you can't miss Jones and I tried I tried and I didn't get very far and I had to put this book down so I'm going into it with a bias of I couldn't read this book the first time I wanted to um, but again something that uh, I, I'm a little embarrassed to say at least uh, in the the course of this podcast that I had not read and, and likely the same for you. Definitely the same for me, but I'm I'm going to say I'm going to commend Livius because um, historically Livius has has leaned toward reading electronic copies of books as opposed to having print copies, which has, uh, especially with older books, um, proved to be uh, detrimental. Uh, when we did Demon Theory, um, I feel like your entire impression of Demon Theory is really your impression of the ebook that you got of demon theory as opposed to like what the story really was. So I'm glad I'm proud to say that Livius ordered and received a physical (laughs) copy of all the, all the beautiful sinners, a a hardcover first edition, no less. Yeah. It's nicer than mine. Um, Yeah. Well, it's in really good shape. So I actually thought it might even be unread because it has some cover wear, like, you know, where it gets flattened on the bottom. 
But um, yeah, I got like 20 pages in and there was a dog eared page, but weird at the bottom who dog ears pages at the bottom. So what? apparently it's weird. Apparently someone got at least 15 pages into this book, which is, you know, as far as I think I got the first time I read it. So, but no chance that ebooks. So when, when Livia says challenges with this book, it's going to be actually because of the story, not because he got like a weird no, uh, OCR correct. scan. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. Listen, there's, but there's, there, okay. So, but, and, and this will be coming up in a future episode. So, but I don't want to talk too much about it now, but the, I, I also read an, a legitimate like arc copy Goodreads book that was, and we'll talk about it again at length in the future, made a book almost unfucking readable. So I haven't turned my back on digital books yet but i am pointing wagging the finger at people who produce digital books that uh you guys need to do better that yeah so a i am fully willing to talk about the what the book is because i can't tell you how excited i am b um it's we are all right so do you want to can we crack this open yes all right so uh because it's been on our social media like i've been a little braggy um, I've recently received a, a physical arc of Stephen Hall's long anticipated second book, Maxwell's Demon. <sighs> Jesse, friend of the podcast, uh, without my knowing, somehow managed to acquire a copy and sent it to me. Blew my mind. I probably practically fainted when I pulled it out of the envelope because I didn't know what it was ahead of time. He didn't warn me. Um, and I was like, holy shit, I have this book that I've been waiting for since I read Raw Shark Text probably in like 2009 or whatever. Um, so uh, this kind of kicks up some dust around the idea of reading this book. And Livius discovers that you can get um, digital arcs from the publisher, requests one, and it goes through and receives the arc. And now one of the things that's kind of a hallmark of, of, of Stephen Hall's original book uh, the raw shark text is that it's got kind of like pictograms or like pictures made of words inside the book. And so that is something that happens in this book as well. And I just assumed that the ebook would contain basically images of that letter art. And I, from what Livia showed me, <laughs> that is absolutely not the case. Yeah. So, um, Stephen was nice enough to send us a very, very small preview when we were uh, emailing back and forth with him um, last year. And he sent us uh, a pictogram. I think that's a good word, if not the right word, but a pictogram of, um, is it a clover maybe? But at any rate, it's some type of leaf. Yeah, yeah, some type of leaf with four um, independent kind of growths. And you would read each one left to right as a paragraph and then move on to the next one in the ebook <laughs> from that galley that translated to one to seven words per line, but they weren't words. They were just a jumble of letters. So it was completely unreadable. So I'm just sent Rob a picture of it. And I was like, I'm going to need to read <laughs> like a paper copy of it. So what did I do? I went looking for an absolute lawbreaker and I found someone selling one on eBay. So I do <laughs> now have a paper copy, um, which I will read again when we intend to review this book, which was, uh, is going to be, I'm going to assume sometime in March. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to give away my impressions of the book, but I will say that I did read the book last week. So I have, all I'm going to say is something that I've been anticipating for over a decade has happened. I read Stephen Hall's new book um, in the actual print intended way, as opposed to in a <laughs> compromised ebook format. I, um, I literally got it started it and messaged Rob the next day and said, I finished the book. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I read it in its compromise. Fat. And, and to, to be fair, I do want to go back and read it because I'm sure it adds to the story. I did not feel like I was missing anything from the story the way I read it because the rest of the text, it's pages and pages of, of standard text. But then when these weird pictograms would show up, I, I would have to flip four or five pages on the Kindle copy to, to get past it. 
So uh, there, there will be some more interesting discussion uh, around that um, when that uh, review comes up. And who knows? Hopefully, maybe, maybe a Stephen Hall interview for the podcast. That would be. We'd have to be like, hey, Stephen, are you OK to talk for five straight hours? Because I feel like that's how I would want that to go down. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll we'll lure him in like we always do. Like, oh, this takes 30 to 45 minutes. You have like a hard stop. And then we drag them in for three plus hours. So we'll, we'll yep. see. But that's uh, hopefully well, the review is for sure on the horizon. And we'll see what we can do to uh, get a, a bucket list writer um, mm. on, on this podcast. Yeah. So a little bit of a diversion. But um, All the Beautiful Sinners coming up next. Pretty excited about that. Um, excited to have Jesse and Misty on for, for another episode. Um, I will say that... Um, they're they're people that traditionally have patreon picks for us um throughout the year they they support us on patreon at the level where they get to choose a review and um as long as this doesn't count jesse at the very least has has chosen a book that he wants us to read he's given me the title so uh, maybe we'll talk about that uh next episode when we're talking to them all right. Um, I think that wraps it up uh, for this week. Again, the Little Sleep is available now whenever you're listening to this, oddly enough. Um, so it releases on the 26th, or at this point, I should say it released on the 26th of January. But when I went in there today, the Kindle was already available. Oh. So, yeah, with with a note saying, like, oh, or if you want to read this now, like it was, it was, a, it was something I haven't seen before. Here, let me actually get it. Uh, this title will be released on January 26, 2021. As an alternative, the Kindle ebook is available now and can be read on any device, blah, blah, blah. So I've never seen that messaging. So Yeah, that's weird. Interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. So uh, Go read it. All right. Next time, uh, we'll be back with all the beautiful sinners and some guest hosts. Until then, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading.